Hallelujah. I'd like to thank our Hosanna Choir for their praise, as well as to our um, Hepzibah praise team for their praise as well. Now, today is United Service, and it is being, um, is being held in Korean. And if you have a trans uh, interpretation device, please make sure it's working. So it seems that everyone's um, devices are working, so thank you. Now, today is Easter Sunday, and there are those who have, haven't been here in a long time and are doing so for the first time, and we truly thank you. Let us greet one another at this time. For those next to you in front and back, and let us say, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you. Now, this Easter Sunday, we can call it as the most important feast for Christians because the risen Lord has died on the cross and resurrected. And what he died on the cross for was ample as far as what God shows us and that's what happened on Easter Sunday and if you look at the if you look at the way of providing offering at the Old Testament the person who is providing the offering would carry whatever it is the, a lamb or a sheep that person that individual needs to cut off the head it's not the priest that does it that person needs to take off the head and skin uh, take the skin off of that animal and what happens is that the priest takes the blood from that animal it's not because the blood is holy right and he sprinkles it on the altar and he um, he anoints he and he puts his hand the individual puts his hand on the head of the animal which simple, uh, which ex, uh, which means that you are passing your sin onto that animal, and as you are killing that animal, it is for you to understand that that animal is dying because of you. So the fact that Jesus died on the cross two thousand years ago is not as simple as the fact that he just died on the cross, and we can see that through TVs or movies. It is really for you to understand the fact that he died on the cross because of you. And when he died on the cross, he probably died due to, uh, due to uh, the fact that he couldn't breathe. Yeah, do you want to try holding, try holding your breath and see how long you'll live? Right? Remember back in the beginning of coronavirus, when the coronavirus hit, that we all had to have our mask on when we pr were praising God? It was tough, right? But Jesus was on the cross for six hours, and he couldn't breathe and eventually died. Eventually, due to our sin, he was whipped. He wore the, uh, the, thorn of the, the crown of thorn. And eventually was crucified. And as we look, as we see Jesus who went through all that, we need to understand and remember the fact that he died like that because of our sins. And I pray that this Easter Sunday will be m even uh, more blessed and more holy as you think that. Yeah, when we look at that and see how what Jesus went through, our sins have been pardoned. And it's with our Lord that we are able to live new lives and that is the gift that he has provided us he took away our sin and in in return gave us righteousness it is a, it is a big grace but if you look at the bible it's not only that but our risen lord has provided us many other gifts so today i would like to look into three gifts that he gave us. So number one, the risen Lord gave us the gift of peace. He gave us the gift of peace. In today's text, 
Jesus went to the disciples who were gripped with fear. Because after the Jews killed Jesus on the cross, he, they were determined to kill all of his disciples the same way. So they were looking for him. So the disciples were gripped with fear and they were trembling and couldn't even walk out of the house. But the risen Lord didn't even open the door but came in through the walls. And the first words that he gave his disciples were, Peace be with you. The thing that the disciples needed the most at the time was peace. Because Jesus knows what we need at any time, and he comes to us with it. Peace be with you. This phrase is not simply words of greetings, right? We, we tell each other, hi, hello. It is to bid peace. It's not just a simple word of greeting. Jesus is a creator. And when he spoke, his words were of creation. So in Genesis chapter 1, it says that in the beginning, uh, there was light, right? He said, let there be light, and there was light. And like that, the words of Jesus was, is of creation. If he says, peace be with you, then there will be peace in your heart. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, what, hap- what, what was the state of this world? Earth was formless, void, and full of darkness. But that one word was, let there be light. And that light overcame all darkness and as such the dis- the disciples uh, were provided this uh, peace peace be with you so what is peace now peace I looked in the dictionary it means in Chinese character overall it means where st- uh, it's, it indicates the state of harmony. There's no, there's no waves. So dictionary says um, state of tranquility or quiet. In Greek, this piece is a rene, which means state of harmony, concord, peace, and well-being. And then in Hebrew, as you know, The word shalom means peace. But the origin of that word is shalem, which means to complete, to be satisfied, to be at peace or harmony. So when you look at the original Greek or Hebrew, peace means where it signifies a, which, in which all things are completed and in a state of satisfaction. But as this word is, is, is really used, especially in all relationships that are in harmony, community, as peaceful, and therefore it signifies the peace of mind. So when God created the universe, he's saw what he created and said that it was very good. And then he rested. So he completed his creation and was extremely satisfied. And in shalom and in peace, he rested. So when we do something and put our, pour our heart into it and complete it, then we are satisfied, right? And likewise, God is co- very satisfied with, with his work. But the problem was that Adam, who God created, he disobeyed the word of God and sinned and eventually fell. And as a result of his fall, God's rest was broken. His beloved son, this, his firstborn Adam, lost to the serpent, and he fell. How could God rest from that point and on? His rest was broken. And the result of Adam's fall became the severance of all relationships. That peace was broken. 
first, the most basic relationship, which was between God and man, was broken. And also, the relationship between man to man was broken, right? Remember the time when Adam and Eve, they blamed each other for the fall? The man said to the woman, I ate the, from the tree because of her, and she said because it was because of the serpent. And after he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, his firstborn, Cain, killed his secondborn, Abel. And after that fall, it was constantly a battle between nation to nation, and war just broke out from that point and on. And in the end... There has become a, a a broken relationship between man and then and the things of the world, right? Because the man was supposed to take care of the world, but that has been broken. Right? Nowadays, if we want to earn money, we have to work. That the creations of this world are not listening to the man. So in Isaiah chapter fifty nine, verse two, it says that that iniquity, the sin, has made a separation between you and your God, right? And also Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25, it says that the iniquities have turned these away and the sins have withheld good from you. So what is needed the most in terms of the recovery from the fall is the recovery of the relationship. There needs to be harmony. There needs to be peace. So first... There needs to be the restoration of relationship with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So after Jesus was crucified and was, re uh, and w was, and res and was resurrected, the first thing that he did was to restore the relationship with God. Because the relationship... The, the origin of all relationship is that is the one with God. And because Jesus has fulfilled that, it is from there that the relationship between man to man, man to all the other creations, will be restored as well. So in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So when the relationship with God is restored, from there, the other relationships will also recover slowly as well. But on the other hand, if you state it, let's say that in my life, if there's any problem with relationship, whether it's, th it's, that, it's that of the man-to-man -man or with the family or with any creations of the world, then the relationship between me and God needs to be looked into first because if our relationship is well, then all the other relationships will also be well too. That is shalom, peace. And number two, we need the restoration of human relationships. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Jesus is our peace, but in his cross is peace. He gave us peace. So our families can be at peace. Our church can be at peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Right? If the peace of our Christ takes control of our hearts, whether we are at church or outside, that peace will show. And we need to take this one body, which is this community, this church. But at this time, if we believe in Jesus and we have accepted him and we believe in him, but even until now, there, there are relationships that have not been restored. And that's the same for me too. But why have those relationships not been restored, even until now? That is because we need to work for them. We need to make the effort. We need to work to restore those relationships and 
our Lord will work with us. If we just stand there and not do anything, it doesn't mean that God will come and just create everything for us, right? So in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 11, it says, For the one who desires life to love and see good days, if you look here, so you need to do three things. Must keep his tongue from, so it says, who, who desires life, love, and see good days. Number one, you must keep his tongue from evil. That's the start of all evil, to say bad things. And number two, uh, he must turn away from evil and do good. And lastly, number three, he must seek peace and pursue it. So if the Lord gave us the gift of peace, we shouldn't just sit still, but from now on, we need to make the effort to restore the broken relationships. And our Lord set an example for us, right? As he, he showed us his humility and that fulfillment to show us that our relationships, broken relationships, can be restored. But if we don't do anything and just expect, and, and we shouldn't just sit around and expect him to do everything for us. Number three, we need the restoration of peace in our hearts. The restoration of peace in our hearts. As I mentioned before, in the words in Greek or Hebrew, the words that mean peace, right, um, means peace that has to do with relationships, which means that there's also the relationships within us. In order to restore the relationship with my heart, even the relationship that I have within me versus me have to, has to be restored. Because in us, there is some sort of an internal battle going on. So we need to end that battle in order to ensure peace in our hearts. Now, this, we're going through our spiritual life, right? But what is the spiritual life for? What is this life of faith? If I can simplify it, the life of faith is to restore the kingdom of God. First, we need to make sure that in our hearts, the kingdom of God come, and then in, within our families. And then furthermore, we need to restore the kingdom of God in our church, and eventually in our society, this nation, to ensure that it can be the kingdom of God. So, and then ultimately, th for this entire world to be restored of ki within the kingdom of God. But that start happens in my heart. So, our Lord said in Luke chapter 17, verse 21, Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Also, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we need to restore the peace in our hearts for the kingdom of God to be established. But for you and I, at this moment, as we see this, do we have peace in our hearts? When you look at yourself, can you say that, can you tell yourself that you're peaceful? Can you say that? Now let us turn to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. We're going to read this together. So here it is in the screen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. R we will read this in one voice. Begin. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? Even if there may be no peace at your heart, I pray that you will believe in this. And as you request for peace from God in prayer, he will provide this for you. In Mark chapter 9, so Jesus went up to the mountain of uh, transfiguration and came down. And when he 
descendant, there was a father who had a son who was、um, who was possessed by spirits. And he said, the father said, "Your disciples couldn't do it, but can you, Jesus, do it?" So in Mark chapter nine, verse twenty-three to twenty-four, Jesus said to him, "If you can, all things are possible to him who believes." And at that moment, the father, the boy's father, cried out and said, "Something that is." That may be an answer for us. In verse twenty-four, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, "I do believe." And he said, "Help my unbelief." That's what he confessed. So, my beloved saints, is this father a believer or a non-believer? Is he believing in this or is he not believing in this? He said, "I do believe." Help my unbelief. Right, it's both. It's both. He is such an honest. He must have been an honest man because this is the answer, and I think that goes the same for me and all of us. Right, we want to believe. We truly want to believe. We want to believe as Jesus believed, but there are times when we can't can't believe. So this father was truly honest. He said, "Yeah, I do believe." But help my unbelief. That's why there's no peace because of this strife that all human beings are fighting because of this strife. But when Jesus cured that son, he also solved the father's strife and helped him to believe. And that is the blessing of peace that our Lord will provide us. So in Romans chapter eight verse six, for the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. But we all have this have this mind of flesh and spirit, right? If we are in good spirits, then we are we have the mindset of the spirit, and vice versa. So in Galatians chapter five verse seventeen, it says, "For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please." It's here. It's a war. There's an internal war going on. And it is with the peace from our Lord that we can calm all this down. When there's confusion, when there's fear, and even to the disciples who had these anxiety, the risen Lord came to them and told them that peace be with you. That is the word of creation. If we say Amen, if we believe, then that word, this word that that went from impossible to possible. Can also change us, and at that moment, the disciples, something changed for them. These disciples who locked the doors and who are in fear, they listened to the word and received the Holy Spirit, and later on, they opened the doors to proclaim the word to other people. And all of these disciples, in the end, they ended up becoming martyrs. And that courage was didn't just come from the disciple; it came from the Lord. Because they had peace in their hearts, they became courageous. Because if you have strife in your heart, that leads to fear. But if there's that passionate love for God, if there's faith for His word, they, they, the disciples for them, they became courageous and firm, and went out to testify about the Lord. So in Psalm chapter one eighteen, verse five to six, especially in verse six. It says, "The Lord is for me; I will not fear. What can man do to me?" Now, this was the confession. This must have been the confession of the disciples. Now, the risen Lord, this working Lord, is on on my side. What shall I fear? What can the other men do to me? Big point number two. Jesus gave us the key to open the structures. Jesus gave us the key to open the structures. Now, up to this point, the Bible was closed. Even if you, if even if they believe, they didn't understand. They couldn't interpret. 
But the risen Lord provided them the interpretation. In Luke chapter 24, verse 32, they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Right? What happened? Were not our hearts burning within us? while he was explaining the scriptures to us. Now these disciples for three years were with Jesus for every single day and they were learning the word. But their hearts were cold. And in terms of the reason, our senior pastor said the following. First, the disciples received it as head knowledge. They just received it as, they just thought of it in their heads. This, these are all spiritual problems, but they try to calculate it in their heads. That's why their hearts were cold. And if your heart, if, when, if your heart is cold, then you can't do any of God's works. So these two disciples were disappointed at Jesus' passing on the cross that they were returning to their home in Emmaus. And that's when the risen Lord appeared to them and were walk and was walking with them, but they couldn't recognize him. Even as they if, uh, even as he was uh, the teacher for three years that they worked with, they couldn't under recognize him. Now this risen Lord is the foreshadowing of the second coming, right? But these two disciples couldn't uh, recognize him at first. So as Jesus ex uh, was walking with them, he explained the uh, scriptures in Luke chapter 24, verses 26 to 27. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then he said he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now, Jesus died on the cross as it was prophesied in the Bible. And, was, and then that's when they understood that the one providing the scriptures to them was the risen Lord. And that's in Luke chapter 24, verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. So... They heard the word and understood what, what the word was and recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared because they understood. And because they recognized him through the Bible, then their hearts burned up within. So if he helps us, if he under, helps us to understand the Bible, then our hearts will burn up. And after that, then our lifestyles will change. Luke chapter 24, verse 33 says, and, and they got up that very hour, that very hour, and returned to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was a place where they were trying to um, kill anyone who believed in Jesus, but they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem because their hearts were burning up. And there were changes in their lives that they didn't fear death, but with firm faith, they went up to Jerusalem. Now, lastly, big point number three, Jesus taught them how to catch fish. The last gift that the risen Lord provided was the way to catch fish. And that word is in John chapter 21, verse 6. So after Jesus died on the cross, Peter, who was his disciple, he left his calling and he went, up to, he went back to Galilee, his hometown. And he went back to what he used to do, which was to fish. But it wasn't just him, but the other disciples gathered and about seven of them came as well. And that's in John chapter 21, verse 6. And it was then that the resurrected Lord, the Lord didn't forsake those who forsook him, but he went up to them. 
he went up to them until the end, came to find them. And what he did there was that many people, many people think that since Jesus was risen, that he did so with the spiritual body, that he is not interested in flesh, right, in the body, but that's not it. The risen Lord is not only deeply interested in our spiritual side, but also on our physical side. He is extremely interested in that. So here, he came up to the disciples who left their place of missionary and asked them, have you caught any fish? And they said, we worked all night long, but we couldn't catch any fish. And that was, Jesus said, for them to cast their net on the right side. And that's in John chapter 21, verse 6. And he said to them, cast a net on the right, si- right hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, even at this moment, Jesus took care of the problem of them, of, of their lifestyle. So first, what we can learn from this is that we must be faithful in our work. They were trying to catch fish, but failed. They worked all night long, but eventually failed. Now, Sear Pastor, in his word, said that that point of failure is the most important point in our, in our lives. Why? Because when we fail, we must, if we give up at that point, then we lose everything. If we catch fish, even if they didn't catch any fish, they still needed to try all night long. Now, if, the, if it doesn't happen at night, try at dawn or try it in the day. That's why, whether it's in, in church or outside in our personal lives, we need to keep trying. And that is when Jesus will come to us and help us to bear fruit. Number two, we must earn using righteous means. We must earn using righteous means. Now, Jesus told them to throw the net to the right-hand side. In the Bible, the right side is the side of blessings and the side of righteousness. So in in terms of everything that we do needs to be righteous in God's eyes. And that is when His blessing will be in everything that we do. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 8 says, Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. And that when that happens, we will have true satisfaction and peace in our hearts. And lastly, number three, our work must be founded upon God's word. Our work must be founded upon God's work. Now, the Lord who told them to cast the net on the right side, John recognized him immediately, and he told Peter that that's Jesus. And the reason why Jesus was able to recognize him was that if you look in Luke chapter 5, there was a, he had a similar experience. And that was when They were out to catch fish all night long, but they couldn't. But that's when Jesus told them to cast their net on the right side. And Peter said, I am a fisherman. I know more than you. You're a carpenter, right? But he didn't do that in Luke chapter 5, verse 5. It says that, I will do as you say and let down the nets. And that was when he was able to harvest a lot of fish. So in everything we do, not only within church or within our lives of faith, whatever we do, we must rely on God's word so that we can bear fruits and we can bear blessed fruits. Students can, in, in prayer, can rely on the word and do well in school for those and the same for those who are at workplaces or businesses or in in your families you can rely on the word 
and receive answers to your prayer. And I pray this upon you in the name of the Lord. And when we do so, the blessing of Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22 will be ours. And if you look here, it says, It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. If you don't rely on the word and you go out to make money, it's not a matter of you earning a lot or, or, or little. That word, that money, it will still be of your profit, but it will come with worries. But if you do so in God, then that you will, re you will be able to harvest money without any worries. And if you earn that money, you will have peace in your hearts. So you will have peace, you will have offerings, you will have these, you will reap all these things in peace. And I pray this upon you in the name of the Lord. And in conclusion, our risen Lord went up to the disciples who were gripped with fear, appeared to them and said, peace be with you. Please believe that in this world in which we're living in, that we are living with the same in fear and anxiety. But please believe in the fact that our risen Lord has also informed us, peace be with you. Because the peace is the greatest. When there is peace, there are no worries. And there, it, everything is good and everything is satisfied. May the word of our Lord that created from impossible, may his words be upon us, our families, our businesses, workplaces, ch church, and in everything that we do, be filling in our hearts. Let us pray. Our living Father God, we truly thank you. We have approached a blessed Sunday of 2021, especially this Easter Sunday, and you have allowed us to come out to you be before you in this century, and we truly thank you. Because you have allowed this gift of your word May this gift not only, not only be of something from 2,000 years ago, but may it be relevant to them and to all these people and their families, for those who say amen to the word. May peace be granted to us as well. May peace be able to drive out all anxieties and fear. And in everything that we do, may there be your blessing, may there be satisfaction, and upon all of our families, may they be overflowing with your joy. Whether it's in our spiritual lives, or outside um, in our personal lives. And for our students who are studying, please may wisdom be with them. And as they all do their best, may they experience God's helping so that they can bear great fruits and help them to feel dedication and satisfaction for all that they do. Please help us to meet our risen Lord and be able to receive new lives. And may our living and working Father God be with us. And with that confidence, help us to have firm and confident faith. And in all this, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray in thanksgiving. Amen. Let us give our glory to our God.